This is one of my favourite paintings. It's by Karen Wallbank, who's a hill farmer and a painter, and I want to tell you her story. It's February the 1st today, and I'm really pleased about that. I'm glad to see the back of January. It seems to have gone on forever. It's actually had me sorting lots of things out. I've been cataloguing photographs and collections and tidying up my computer and making things. But these vid videos I'm making really keep me going. The research leads me down so many paths, it's a wonder I ever get them made. I have to keep going up into the loft as well, which is pretty untidy. When we moved house, anything we didn't need immediately got shoved up in the loft to be sorted out later. So I have to keep paying visits up there to find things. This is a box of photographs. And when I um, got to the bottom of this box looking for something, I found this book, which is on the top. I know it doesn't look like a book. It's a sort of book. And um, I remembered what it was. So I put it on top, took a photograph of it. It tells a story, this book. Well, it tells lots of stories. But the main one is about the person who put it together, Karen Wallbank, who painted that lovely picture of a hill farm. This book brought back memories. I remembered the day the postman handed it to me at Castlegate House on the doorstep. It looked a bit dubious and so did he. The wallpaper wrapping was torn and sticky. The name and address was a scribble that was a bit hard to decipher among rather busy wallpaper. I knew it was immediately. I'd last seen that William Morris wallpaper on the wall of the parlour of in artist Karen Wallbank's farmhouse in 1987 on my first visit. She always wrapped parcels of her unframed paintings in wallpaper like this, layers of it. Opening them was like a game of pass the parcel. It was like a walk through the farmhouse over the years. A recent one had a note inside which said, I'm repapering the parlour, got fed up with this one, it's been on for more than 20 years, time for a change, I'm going minimal this time. The next layer down was in the new minimal paper, and I had to laugh. It was still William Morris, but in slightly more muted colourways. Karen couldn't do minimal in a white cube in the Gobi Desert. I picked up the book. It was bulging and untidy, a very fat book. The front of it is on the left. It was interesting. It was a sort of jewel encrusted black material and with sequins and beads and golden embroidery scattered anywhere. I expected the back to be the same, but it wasn't. It was plain black and it had all these names cut out and stuck on. I think there are three patches where whatever it was has fallen off. I wonder what that was. They were a bit like fridge magnets and they were names I recognised. And they were, I realised they were artists I'd shown at the gallery. It fell open at the first page due to the rotating shiny purple rosette that she'd stuck on, which prevented me closing it again. Not that I wanted to, I was curious. There was glue all over the place. I laughed as I saw the message. To Chris, best wishes, love Karen. So I took it downstairs, forgetting all about what, what I'd gone up there for. And I sat absorbed for several hours. It was a trip down memory lane. All those names posted on the back were represented inside and a letter was tucked into the next page. I straightened out the crumpled piece of paper. I've got it here in my hand. You probably hear it rustling. And this is what it said. Hello, Chris, and a very happy birthday. Well, lass, we've both had a few ups and downs, but to be honest, when the going got tough, I thought at least I can paint. And even if you did chuck a few in the skip, the whole thing keeps me going. I wanted to buy you something for your birthday, but what? A jumper from Marks and Sparks? No. Jewellery, you seem to have a vast array, well enough to deck Hollywood out with. Anyway, so I decided to do a little scrapbook with an assortment of artists that you've shown at Castlegate. What a wonderful bunch of artists. The paintings have brought me lots of pleasure and, for me, inspiration over the years. I've tried to copy June Bennett's Cumbrian cottages and Mike Bennett's birds, Peace Cod's mountains. 
I became a finalist at the Ling after you went to view the, after we went together to view the Sheila Fell at Abbot's Hall. I even tried sticking heather on my foals in the wake of Catherine Holmes. However, in the end, it all sort of comes together in the Wallbank style. So long may it last. Now then, I feel I must warn you about my little Prezi. I was always a dud with scissors and glue at school, and not much has changed, you know. I stuck the book to the duvet at one point. Was she doing this in bed? I've copied X all over me cuffs, and the dog ain't too chuffed either. I have cut off the names of the painters. Well, you've got to keep your old brain cells ticking over, haven't you? So you'll have to guess and maybe pencil their names in. However, I have put a few rogue ones in. Can you spot them? OK, Chris, here's to many more celebrations. Bring it on. Love, Karen. I had to laugh at that. I couldn't remember which year it was, but um, because there's no date at the top, as you can see. But um, I, I, I think I might have nailed it a little bit more now. I opened the book and I sat absorbed for several hours. I straightened everything out and turned the pages and it was wonderful. This first page is Angie's Dancer. Angie Summers, my assistant for many years and a very good painter. And it all came flooding back. All these surprises. There were some Wallbanks uh, originals among them, but I haven't found them yet. The one at the top is a, a group of Russians that came over and did a wonderful exhibition. I think they were from the Ukraine or somewhere. Below that is a a June Bennett, Cumbrian Cottage. Opposite's a Nick Schlee, who came and stayed in the studio at the top of the house. I don't know where the, the next one down, who did that one? Ah, this one's a good uh, memory. The one on the right was a wonderful West Indian woman who did batik paintings, and they were great. Uh, on the on the left-hand page, ah, it, that helps me to date it, um, two Percy Kellys at the top. So it must have been after 1993. And below that, there is a Karen, easily recognisable, but she's actually pencilled or inked out the name so that I had to guess who, who it was. That was pretty easy, especially on the next page where we've got the one you've seen already. And um, can you see all, all the paste and everything uh, that, that's all about... The one on the right is um, Linda Cooper. She did a fantastic exhibition called Through the Cat Flap. And there's the one we used on the card that um, Karen had picked up. And that one, that had me thinking, but it's Jeanette Lassen from Edinburgh. She always did some beautifully bright, cheery up paintings. Ah, the one on the left is Michael Bennett. And there are his muses, the three white birds. He was always trying to catch his muse. And on the right, that's a Bill Peascod. That's uh, one he did, a very minimal one that he did, of the, could, simply called The Lake. I think it's Buttermere, don't know. Oh, and this is the Picasso I did. I'd almost forgotten that. We didn't have any paintings. I couldn't possibly have um, afforded any originals. But uh, it, was, it was an exhibition of his etchings. I then thought, well, what did Karen mean about surprises inside? And there it was. I had to put my fingernail under this one to make sure it was an original rather than just something stuck on. And that was one of her flocks of sheep. She could just put her finger on sheep. She could, she could, she knew them through and through. And he, oh yeah, this is, this is cattle too. She could understand cattle as well. She knew how they were built. And so she, you always need to know the general anatomy of an animal to actually draw it well. And she could certainly do that. The friendship between me and, and Karen goes back a very long way. And it is a friendship. I met Karen a few months after in the gallery in July 1987. I'd been down to Kirby Lonsdale to see a master um, picture framer called Ian Higginbottom, of all names, uh, who'd also opened a gallery. And when I got there, he handed me a phone number and said, look, I've had this woman in. 
she she farms not far from here in another village um, and she's been in with a couple of paintings that were really good I think you'd like them but she got scared off when I quoted her a price for the framing and she went but she did leave her phone number and she lives nearby and I I think you'd like her work now I'm, I was always on the lookout for artists but I always try to find ways of looking anonymously because it's so embarrassing if you get stuck in a, an artist's studio and you don't want the work. It's very, very difficult to make an exit with some sort of honour on both sides. But I made an exception with this. I left with this phone number in my hand and I rang the number when I got home. Hello? came the voice at the other end. Oh, is that Karen Warbike, I said. Aye, she said, warily. Well, I said, my name's Chris Wadsworth and I've got a gallery in Cockermouth. Ian Higginbottom in Kirby Lonsdale's told me that you're an artist. Well, she said nervously, and it sort of tailed off. Um, could I come and see your work? Silence. Er... Uh, I'm very busy now. I'm sorry. Well, how about I could come one day next week? Are you free Thursday afternoon? Um, mm, well, I, all right then. Ah, I said, well, I haven't got your address, Karen. Can you tell me how to find you? Well, she said it's right easy, really. When you get to that village, turn right under Railway Bridge and it's fifth house on right. Easy, really. There was a pause. As if that was it. I thought I needed a bit more information. So she decided to tell me a bit, be a bit more specific. I, she said, well, first there's house you, can't, you can see. And then there's house you can't see, both on the right. And then a barn conversion from them in Leeds. And then it's Parker's farm. And then it's us. It's simple, really. Mm. Well, it was a dull late October day when I took to the road. It was a bit like this painting of Karen's, really. I wasn't helped by this dense mist. I found the railway bridge and I saw the first house she described on the right, as the house she could see. But after that, nothing. Well, I wouldn't see the house I couldn't see, would I? The single track on Fence Road had sheep sitting on it, in many places, and cows kept looming up. I was lost, really, in no time. No sat-nav, no mobile, and the road was climbing, and the fog thickening, and there was no sign of anybody and no other vehicles. After a few miles, I pulled off the road to think about what I was going to do next, and I was just going to turn round and give up and go back down to the village when I saw a diffused headlight coming towards me and a battered blue van emerge from the mist. I quickly started the engine and turned round and tailgated it. It could be the only vehicle of the day. Maybe it was going down back to the village and I could maybe get a cup of tea and escape to low ground in the motorway. After about a mile, which deteriorated quickly into potholes and puddles, and silhouettes of abandoned farm machinery kept appearing in my fog lights, like huge Henry Moore sculptures. Impulsively and desperately, I kept following the van, which had turned off, until it stopped in a muddy farmyard, whereupon the driver's door opened and a man got out. He was small and slight, slightly stooped, he closed the van door with a metallic clang and limped round to the back to open the doors and unload whatever it was he was carrying. But he suddenly caught sight of me as I started to get out of my car and he jumped in surprise. He obviously wasn't used to strangers on the road. Feeling foolish, I stammered, uh, I'm looking for Karen Wallbank. Aye, he said slowly. Do you know where she lives? Aye, he said. Well, where does she live? I asked eagerly, hoping he'd tell me a little bit more than that. Here, he said in the same flat voice and nodded towards the farmhouse. 
At that moment, a young, heavily pregnant woman with long golden hair appeared at the farmhouse door. I assumed this was the painter's daughter. From the flat northern voice on the telephone, I had created a mental image of a round, middle-aged farmer's wife with apple cheeks and, an a- and in an apron. That was a bit sexist of me, wasn't it? I'm sorry. Oh, I've come to see Karen Woolbank, I said def- defensively. Uh, she is expecting me. Aye, that's me, she said nervously. You best come in. I followed her through the kitchen into the parlour with its big open fire and gleaming oak furniture. It was so welcoming, I immediately felt a lot better. All around me on the walls were beautiful, misty landscapes. I was so excited at the quality of those paintings that I barely noticed the litter of kittens that were skittering around the room all over the furniture and each other. One of these paintings in particular held my gaze. It was huge, magnificently minimal. Pale sheep on on a textured, a very large textured canvas. With just a few strokes of the brush, she got the sheep exactly right. This was a woman who knew sheep. I do like that, I said cautiously, trying hard not to sound patronising. Where did you get a canvas as big as that? Well, she answered slowly, sofa needed recovering. Springs were hanging out of bottom because kids had been jumping on it. So I got some Essien to do it. I spread it out on floor and when I looked at it, I decided to paint on it instead. Ah, that explained why the springs of the sofa I was sitting on were digging into me. But the pain was worth it, I thought. Is this an oil? I asked. It was a silly question, wasn't it? Oh, no, she said, it's mainly Dulux. I use Otacan to paint with. The Hessian needed stretching properly, and when I looked more closely, I realised that the frame was a bit of skirting board with roughly mitered corners joined together with an industrial staple staple gun of the sort used by farmers for fencing. Of course it was. I could exhibit and sell these, I told her. Would you want to do that? She gave me a pitying look, clearly totally unconvinced that I would want to sell her work. She was particularly alarmed when I said her pictures would have to be reframed. Ah, what will that cost? she asked suspiciously. I had the feeling she regarded me as a potential cons woman, and I guess that she thought we'd now got to the scam. I was going to ask for money. I'll pay for the framing, I said quickly, and then when they sell, I'll deduct it. But what if they don't sell, she said. Oh, Karen, I'm sure they will. Trust me. What makes you say that? Well, I put three in art show in village all last summer and nobody bought them. That one there, she said, pointing to a small green landscape, which had been placed mountless and askew with ragged edges in a clip frame that was far too big for it. That one there's been in our holiday cottage for three years, with £10 on it, and nobody's shown any interest at all. I wasn't surprised, but I didn't say so. If I could take that one and reframe it, I promised her, I will sell it for £350. I felt a bit like, like a horse trader. I don't believe you, she said, but you can give it a try if you want. I came away with four oils and the little green watercolour. As I left with my stash of paintings, I asked her who the man was that I'd met in the farmyard. Oh, that had happened by my husband George, she said. And seeing my face, she said, he's a lot older than me, you know. And then she abruptly disappeared inside the farmhouse. I shrugged my shoulders and set off back down the bumpy track, heading for civilization. On the journey back up the motorway, my mind was full of questions. What was this beautiful young woman with an extraordinary talent doing up there on an isolated farm? Why had she married a little old man? What was the attraction? And where had she learnt, led, where had she learned to paint like this? It took a week or so to get the canvases stretched and framed, and they looked magnificent. Hung in the Adam room, As part of the Christmas exhibition, they sold in a couple of days. Oh, this is Karen, by the way. 
standing outside her farm. The first two were going to live in a rather grand castle alongside a Gainsborough and some other distinguished family portraits. I rang Karen immediately with the good news, which she received in a totally unfazed manner, and I wondered if she understood what I was telling her. Moving swiftly on, I casually asked if she had any more paintings. Oh, aye, she said. There's a stack more in barn with cats. My mind immediately went back to sitting in her parlour, with that small army of kittens climbing up and down my legs and the furniture and the curtains. Horrified at the thought of all those little claws digging into the precious canvases, I set off straight away to get them. This time, I found it first time. I gave Karen her cheque, and she was delighted. And to see her dis- disbelief at the side of it was wonderful. Even with the cro- cost of framing and commission, it was several thousand still. And at last I had a reaction. Hey, she said, George, you'll never believe this. Looking at the cheque. Hey, it's your name on the cheque, I said. Why don't you um, open a bank account for your, for your art? For your art money, and then it won't get mixed up with the farm, will it? I got a raised eyebrow in reply. Um, so where are the other paintings? I continued. Oh, well, they're in barn, she said. Do you want to see them? It was a bright day, but the barn was dark. It was only Its only light came from the open door and a small dirty skylight curtain with cobwebs. It was a repository for broken appliances. There was a dead washing machine and a tumble dryer. There was broken farm machinery plastic toys and bikes, all the de- de- detritus of a farm. Saddles and tackle were draped everywhere, and the paintings were stacked up hazardly against an old table. And there was a yellow and green waterproof pair of leggings casually slung over them. They were dripping gently onto the earth floor and across the picture. One of the canvases was leaning against the corner of the table, and I could see even in the gloom that it was badly dented. Um, where do you paint, I asked. Here, she replied, in that monosyllabic way of speaking. Every snippet of information I got had to be extracted with care and patience. We carried the paintings into the farmhouse, where I could see them properly and spread them out. There were about 30 really good ones. Karen was watching me anxiously. At least I'd got her full attention at last. And after some thought, I gave her two choices. You know, Karen, I said boldly, if you want to sell me to sell these for you as well, I could either trickle them through the gallery and make you a steady income, or I could wait until I have a slot in a few months' time and give you a solo show. After I'd explained what a solo show meant, she had no hesitation. I'll go for the solo, she decided. But it'll have to be after baby's born and not be at lambing time either. We've got her hands full at lambing time. The baby was due in early January and she already had two boys who were at school. But it was a good decision. This was a woman with a practical brain as well as talent. What was she doing married to that little pale-faced man, I thought, once again? He must have some hidden talent and charm, I thought, but I decided not to speculate about it. I was consumed with curiosity, but I didn't show it, lest it frighten her off. I realised I'd have to tease a CV out of her. And over a cup of coffee and a premature lamb nestling by the arger in the warm kitchen, that, that cat doesn't look too happy either, does it? She, but she told me her story. She'd been born and brought up in Leeds and did well at school. She wanted to go to agricultural college, but her art teacher felt her talents lay more in art than biology. So at 16, she went to Jacob Kramer College in Leeds, where she studied art. One of the lecturers had a holiday house on the moors, not far from where she lives today. And one holiday, he sent a small group of students, including Karen, to the house for a week to study vernacular architecture. She laughed as she told me how she met George. Hey, I'd just seen the film Far From the Madding Crowd with Alan Bates. George is just like him, don't you think? 
I nodded silently. I'd only had that brief encounter with the man in the blue van, but he was nothing like Alan Bates. Thomas Hardy's Bathsheba Everdeen shot through my mind at the time. I spent the whole week helping on the farm, she continued. I didn't get much artwork done. And at the end of the week, the lecturer came up to do an assessment and he made the comment that some people had learned a lot about vernacular architecture and others seemed to know a lot more about the local farmer. And he were looking at me when he said it. He must have heard the local gossip. After that, I came back every holiday, most weekends, and I loved it. At the end of the course at 18, she got an interview at Goldsmiths College in London. One of her lecturers had put her application in because he didn't want her special talent wasted. Goldsmiths is one of the country's leading art colleges, you probably know, and there's huge competition to gain a, gain a place. Karen was convinced she didn't stand a chance of being selected, but she went to London with her portfolio anyway. A few weeks passed and she was back on the farm working with George when the letter with a London postmark came to her home in Leeds and her father rang her to tell her it had arrived. Karen told him to open it and read it out to her. And against all expectations except those of her perceptive teacher, she'd been offered a place and had to make an immediate decision about her future. It was such a hard choice, but the lure of life on the farm was too strong and she decided to marry George instead. She told me she had no regrets, though farming 300 acres with sheep and beef cattle must be hard work and she does her share of it. She has her own horse and two sheepdogs, which she reared and trained herself. And despite this very busy life and two, two children, soon to be three, she'd never stop painting. I asked tentatively, what does George think about your painting? Well, she said, he sees it a bit a waste of time, she admitted. He makes a joke of it, but he sometimes told me to go, tells me to go and do something useful and paint gate. <laughs> I hope to change that, I thought to myself. I didn't think I was going to like George very much. I loaded the car with the paintings, promising to return for the rest in a few weeks, having first restacked them carefully out of the way of feline claws. When I re returned for them, she had a little red-headed baby girl called Hannah, and still no sign of George. However, I was getting to know Ka Karen a lot better, and she trusted me now, particularly as my cheque hadn't bounced. Uh, where's George? I asked before I left. I still haven't met him properly, you know. Oh, he's hiding, she explained in a straightforward manner. He calls you that posh woman from the gallery and when he knows you're coming, he disappears. So as the exhibition drew closer, I became a, a little bit nervous. What was I doing? Was I messing about with these people's lives? Would this show unsettle Karen? Would George be jealous of the attention she was definitely going to attract? Had I revived any longings in her to go to college? Would she have any regrets at choosing the path she had? Worst of all, would George see me as a threat? I started to lose sleep over it. They arrived early for the opening. I heard the Land Rover come into the car park and I braced myself. Karen came in first. She was very nervous and she was sure nobody would turn up and nobody would like her work. But she looked lovely with her long blonde hair and healthy complexion. When George followed her through the door, my mouth literally fell open. This was not the man who had guided me to the farm in his blue van. Instead, it was a tall, dark, ruddy-faced chap with a lovely broad smile, about 20 years older than Karen, but not totally unlike Alan Bates. I'm not good at concealing my feelings. Some of you will know that. And when I realised that they'd seen my surprise, I had to explain. And they both roared with laughter. Hey, she must mean Fred the Potato Man, said George. I think he came round that day. And you thought he was me, he said, looking at me challengingly. Hey, you've been hiding from me every time I've come up to the farm, you know, George, I pointed out. How was I to know what you looked like? This really broke the tension and we made our way into the Adam room, where Karen's pictures were hanging. She stopped in the doorway and stood quite still scanning the room in silence. She looked round questioningly at me and she said, Did I do these? 
I assured her that she had, and she slowly moved forward as if she was sleepwalking, studying each painting as though it was the first time she'd ever seen it. I think it was the first time she'd ever properly seen her paintings, well-framed and well-lit. I left her there when people started arriving, and the red spots began to go up, and I could hear George in the background saying proudly, "Uh, My wife, the painter, and I knew we were home and dry. That's the one you saw on the card. A large painting of a hillside dotted with grazing sheep had a price tag of of more than a thousand pounds. When the red spot went on that one, I heard George exclaim to anybody that was listening, Good God, she's making more Pareda sheep than I am. And everybody laughed. We had tea in the kitchen afterwards with a few artists and clients and George sat proudly at the head of the table and poured the tea. Patrick Gordon of Pennington of Muncaster Castle was there. A Scottish landover owner, a sheep farmer, poet, and most importantly to George, a member of the National Farmers Union. He brought three of Karen's paintings for his daughters in the Christmas exhibition, and he and George discussed at length the price of stock and land, and as they left, George commented to me, I like this art lot, you know. It's better than farming any day. You meet a better class of people, don't you? Karen went on to bigger and better things. I entered her, in uh, one of her paintings, this one, in the Lane Competition, which was a prestigious nationwide art award sponsored by the Lane Group of Construction Companies, Karen would never have got round to entering it herself. So I sent for an an entry form. I filled it in. I signed it. Yeah, I did force Karen's signature, but the needs must. And I posted it, the entry form. I then selected this painting. I framed it. And then found she had been selected. And I took it, delivered the painting to Newcastle. The snag there was, though, that if they accepted your form, you had to get it over to Newcastle within a day or two. And if they didn't then get it on the shortlist, you had to go back and collect it within three days or they would discard it because they couldn't store things for very long. Well, it was selected and she won the regional prize because there were there were these um, these exhibitions in all sorts of different places right through the country and she got the regional prize I think it was 500 pounds and her work went down to the Mal galleries where all the other finalists went and there were a lot they chose about 10 from every center and um, she became the runner-up in the national final she won a big cash prize and the Lane group invited her and George to come to London for the opening on an all-expenses-paid trip, she couldn't get over her excitement when she rang me. They travelled first-class rail from Oxenholm and stayed in a five-star hotel. And they were taken to the gallery, which, is a, as the name suggests, is situated in the Mall, in a chauffeur-driven car, Karen told me. She said she felt like the Queen. She met the chairman of Lane, who must have been a little bemused, because I was just passing when I heard her tell him that none of it was anything to do with her. And I thought, oh dear, he looked he looked worried too. She called me over and she said, oh, he's been asking how I managed to paint and farm. And I said, oh, Chris does it all really. She stretches the canvases, she orders the paint, she frames them, titles them and she sells them. So what do you do, Karen? I said to her just to prompt her. Well, I just paint them, don't I? In a way, this was true. I felt rather insecure selling paintings created in Dulux on upholsterous Hessian. And from that first exhibition onwards, I'd ordered properly stretched canvases, good paper and good oil paints. This meant I slept better at night, free from this recurring nightmare I had about selling a painting and then the, the paint falling off a few years later, leaving a blank canvas. Karen still reverts to her old ways from time to time, though, 
And sometimes I'm faced with a strange collection of work on a mad plethora of materials in all shapes and sizes, rarely square, which I have to somehow sort out. Sometimes a piece could only be described as mixed media. She probably dropped it in the yard in transit while the paint was still wet. And so it now bore traces of cow dung and horsehair among the paint. But at least she now had a proper indoor studio. They'd built an extension with a light and airy workspace from the proceeds of her sales. This is a lovely photograph of George. I've only got this one photograph of him, but we had a New Year's party and everybody had to come as a painting. And George came as, guess what? Um, he came as the Laughing Cavalier. Karen came as a Mondrian and it was just a great party and everybody enjoyed it. And this was the painting that came, that went to the lane. Now, after, after um, Karen's competition success, Border Television got hold of the story and they wanted to do a programme about her. So I drove the production team down to the farm in convoy because I didn't want them to get lost like I had the first time. They might have been lost for three days on the moor. I drew up at the door, wildly hoping that she'd remember we were coming and hadn't gone off on the quad bike or a horse, but I needn't have worried. Karen came out to greet me in unbelievably clean jeans. She looked gorgeous. Now this is a treat because it's, um, it's an excerpt from the film that Border Television made that day. Meet Karen Warbank, mother of three, farmer and now artist extraordinaire. When she's not shearing sheep or looking after her family, she's to be found seeking asylum in a tiny attic room where she creates masterpieces fans will pay thousands for. It was through her love of art that she met her now husband, George. But how does she control her hectic schedule? Well, that's a question I do get asked quite often. Um, I don't let it be a problem. I've just got to fit it in whenever and wherever I can. It's usually short bursts of about 15 minutes. It's a bit of a laugh between me and Chris, between boiling the potatoes and things, you know, and they usually burn. She was discovered by Cockermouth gallery owner Chris Wadsworth, who tackled the clumsy Cumbrian fell roads on a whim. Well, it's like cowboy and Indian country, isn't it? She lives in a very, very remote farm. And I couldn't find her. My directions um, that she gave me were very, very vague. And why I didn't ever give up, I don't know, because it took me hours up and down that road finding her. What's perhaps most unusual about Karen's method of painting is that despite the fact she's often inspired by farming scenes, she works indoors. Well, I never go out and outside with, a, with me easel and paint. I always retain things in my memory. And um, when I actually go up and start to paint, it usually, you know, comes out then. And until Chris stumbled upon her art, it had always been a bit of a joke for her husband. Well, initially, I think it was a case of, um, it was like somebody knitting. It was just a hobby, you know. I mean, he used to say, you want to go do something more useful and paint gates and things. Um, and we had a laugh and farms used to come in and, you know, wonder what I was doing and that. But now there's, it's taken off and uh, there is money behind it. They've seen it in a new light. Even now, Karen finds it difficult to believe how much her work sells for. And as for Chris, she can't believe her luck at having found such talent. Oh, a tremendous surge of, of what I call the buzz factor, because I have to go to a lot of exhibitions finding artists for this gallery. And um, I, I rely totally on instinct. And every now and again, it doesn't happen that often, you see somebody's work and you think, wow, that's tremendous. And walking into that parlour where there were about six large paintings on the walls six years ago, I just took one look and thought, wow, this is it. It's so exciting. But despite her rush of success, Karen insists she still paints for her own enjoyment and takes little interest in her pictures when completed. As for long-term ambitions, she just wants to carry on enjoying all three aspects of her busy working day.
I did take a couple of stills from that um, from that bit of bit of uh, film because I just wanted to point out to you that it all moves so fast that behind my car is the opening to the barn where Karen did all those paintings, those early paintings. You can see how dark it is. And this is where we're carrying in the uh, nice stretched canvases, nice and clean and stretched and lovely. And there's little Hannah in the doorway, getting in the way as usual, as we carry them in. I did that every time I went down there. I would take some materials down with me and come back with a car loaded up with uh, wonderful paintings. And there's Karen and Hannah wandering through one of the fields when Hannah is quite young. It was a long time after this because Karen took some time out um, to look after Hannah, who is, who is quite badly autistic and uh, quite demanding, really. So the painting slowed down and almost halted at times. But we kept in touch the whole time. And um, I would go down and see them and we'd do mad emails a lot. And then one day I got a phone call from a very, um, a very well-known gallery owner in London called David Messam. Messam, he and his son had a gallery and have a gallery in Cork Street behind the Royal Academy. I mean, it's in Mayfair and it's in absolutely um, the right place for 20th century art. And um, he was looking for northern artists for an exhibition he wanted to do. And he wondered if he could come up and see me. I didn't answer straight away because he, he wanted me to get some work together to select for the show. And I really began to wonder whether I, I wanted to share my heart sought out and well-nurtured artists with a London gallery. They were like my family now. I was thinking of Karen and the quiet Michael Bennett. I could sell all I could get of their work. It didn't make economic sense at all. What if David Messam wanted a Percy Kelly exhibition? People would queue all night to possess a Kelly. So what was in it for me? Hold on a minute, I reminded myself. This wasn't about me. It was about the artists and my pledge to do my very best for them. This would be a marvellous opportunity for them to broaden out and hit the cap capital. So I agreed. David Messam came, he saw, and he selected. Running your own gallery, you know, it's a lonely path and it's an isolated one because you live and die by your own judgment. And it was an affirmation of my choice of artists. He chose several oils by Sheila Fell, 25 Percy Kellys, and 20 unframed paintings from the Hill Farm by Karen Warbank. He took them with him there and then. After he left, I rang Karen. I told her she'd been talent spotted. How would you like to show in London, Karen? What, me, she said, showing in London? Next year? I can't believe it. Well, there'll be an opening and a catalogue, so you better start to get some good work together. There was a pause. Aye, well, George will have to get his teeth done now, she said. His front palate's gone, and he reckons he's too old to bother with it. Dentist told him it'll be about 800 pound, that's probably got something to do with it, I bet. I'll tell him he's not coming to Cork Street with me unless he gets it done. That'll sort him out. I took this to mean that she was up for it. When the catalogue arrived, this is Messam's in Cork Street, it's very posh. Um, the catalogue arrived some months later and it was thick and glossy and expensive. And there was a photograph of, of Karen riding a horse on the fells beyond the farm. And inside there was her story the woman who gave up an art career to marry a farmer. Her paintings looked great, and I was still flicking through when this email arrived. Dear Chris, it was from Karen, of course. Oh my God, I just received the bottle top catalogue, and I feel quite humble. Talk about the best of the best in there. Anyway, I feel I own my spot. It looks good. I had a gulp at the price list. I hope I get at least one sold. I replied to this, dear Karen, glad you like the catalogue. You've come such a long way and what a journey. And never mind Goldsmiths, you've done it with everything stacked against you. I don't know how you brought up Hannah and the boys and looked after the farm and everything and still produced 
all these brilliant paintings. But tell me one thing though, why do you say the bottle tops? Am I missing something? The reply came thick and fast. All it said was, bottle tops, Cork Street, Karen, kiss. Karen was determined not to miss her London debut, as was George. He had shelled out the 800 pund, had his teeth done and was giving them an outing. After dropping their bags at the Mayfair apartment she booked online, Karen couldn't resist a surreptitious peep at the gallery prior to the opening. I don't think they got, they'd got they been to London very much. She was also worried that they might get less lost later in the dark of the evening and not be able to find it. They'd never been to Cork Street before. And they'd rarely been to London. This time Karen had purchased an A to Z and they soon found the Royal Academy. She said to me that evening, we'll go back tomorrow and have a look what's on there. She also found posh Burlington Arcade with its thick red carpet and liveried fit footmen at each end. George didn't want to go through there at first, she said. He thought it were private but not for the, and not for the likes of us. Then he thought we might have to pay. But I told him not to be daft. We're as good as anybody else. And if we had to pay, we could afford it, couldn't we? Once inside, however, George hadn't wanted to leave. I can't get him past the expensive watch shop, she said. He'd always fancied a Rolex, but now he's thinking about Jaeger Lecoute. Said they were less showy. Then he found the shoe shine in the middle. I had to stop him getting his shoes cleaned, even though they weren't as mucky as they usually are. Finally, they'd got to Cork Street. I'll just go back to that, try and see how Karen did on her first visit. And Karen saw her painting in the window. That's it, straight ahead. I couldn't believe it, she said. I lost me cool. I think I had a bit of a screech. And Karen laughed. George told me to shut up because people were looking. Well, it was such a surprise, wasn't it? Me, Cork Street, in the window. Anyway, I don't go in just then. It's ever so posh. I needed to get used to the idea, so we wandered back to the flat and picked up stuff for breakfast at the Tesco Express. A hey, Chris, fancy that. Tesco in Mayfair. Trust Karen to have found one. That evening, I went round there. They always, Messam's put on a really good, good show. They have the most beautiful floral displays and the smell, the heady smell of the scent of the flowers is wonderful. They have fabulous canapes and wine in lovely sparkling glasses. But I was really waiting around, looking out for Karen and George, just to make them feel perhaps a little bit more comfortable. The place was buzzing with well-dressed, well-heeled clientele when Karen and George arrived. And I was just a bit nervous because I thought they might be feeling shy about coming in. But I needn't have worried. It was an ice cold evening and as they made their entrance I was struck by what a handsome pair they were they made. Karen looked confident in a pale green silk coat dress which complemented her golden hair. George handed over his long grey wool overcoat to the uniformed doorman to reveal a smart grey striped suit and only his bright eyes and healthy ruddy complexion gave a clue as to his open air life. Still, it was good to hear honest northern accents among the London glitterati. The Messams, father and son, made a fuss of Karen, and by the time she reached me through the dense crowd, she had four more red spots and an art critic in tow. That was one of the paintings that went. I had a lovely sense of contentment that evening, and I cast my mind back when I got back to the hotel to my discovery of Karen in 1987, when she was heavily pregnant with her third child. She'd given me such poor directions to her isolated fog-bound farmhouse and was so suspicious of me and reluctant to let me take any of her work. I don't know what made me persevere. Pure instinct or willfulness or daftness, I think. And the quality of her paintings, of course. Her natural talent was immediately obvious. Even if she was painting on upholster as a hessian and using skirting board for frames. Even if some of her paintings ended up a bit mixed media, 
when they accidentally drop butter side down in the horsehair and cow dung of the yard. This is Karen, much more recently, um, sitting in their new house. The boys, her two boys, have taken over the farm and they have converted a barn into a very, very nice house now. There it is, still in the middle of nowhere. Oh, the slide I just showed you, uh, the photograph of Karen in, in black and white, that photograph was taken by Hannah, her daughter, who is a very competent photographer. She's now over 30, which makes me feel very old, as it must be a lot more than 30 years since uh, I first met Karen. The house is lovely. There's no sign of the Mad William Morris wallpaper at all. The walls are plain, tasteful, farrow and ball, and they are adorned with Karen's wonderful paintings everywhere. And Karen's keeping hens. She's still got her dog. She's still got her horse. And there are some more hens. And she's still painting, but now she's painting just for herself. Her walls are full of lovely, lovely things. And she's decorated the place with real taste. And to me who retired, George is now in his 90s as well. But to me who retired 10 years ago, and they retired some time ago. It's a lovely contented feeling to still keep in touch and know what's going on. It's a lovely story, isn't it? And this is where it all started. <laughs>